Welcome to Pocket Economics, a guide to changing lives. It's our podcast about the ideas which are shaping the EBRD regions and beyond. I'm Jonathan Charles. Today, we have another very special guest with us, Suma Chakrabarti, the president of the EBRD. And full disclosure, of course, he's my boss. But uh, I'm sure that won't affect my questioning. I know he's someone who appreciates straight talking, not afraid of a free and frank discussion, which uh, we're going to have here. And I hope that's uh, going to advance us in our understanding of development finance. Uh, It is something, obviously, the future of development finance, something we think about all the time at the EBRD. It's central to what we do and to making sure we continue to to be effective. It's an area Sumer himself has been involved in professionally for much of his life and long before he arrived here at the EBRD. Now, as usual on this programme, we try to define our terms. So what actually is development finance? Let me give you one possible definition. Development finance funds economic and social progress across national boundaries, particularly, but not exclusively, in the world's poorer countries. Uh, An ever greater priority for such finance is sustainable development, development that meets the needs of today without compromising the planet's future. Development finance has, as a rule, been the responsibility of bilateral development agencies or so-called international financial institutions, such as the World Bank or the EBRD. Either way, national governments as well, by the way, have always played a major role in running the bodies that raise and manage development uh, finance. Suma, that's one definition. What do you make of that definition? Well, I think it's a very perfectly adequate de- definition. I think uh, I would talk about development finance in the, in the following terms. First of all, you've got to decide what is development, and then you've got to decide what sort of finance do you need to meet those development goals. And that concept of what is development has changed uh, quite clearly. I think uh, it's changed over the last 50, 60 years. But if you just take the last couple of decades, I think at the beginning of that period, many of the development practitioners would have said the Millennium Development Goals, the eight goals, really actually summarize uh, the development project, if you like. Now, looking at those goals now, they were very, very important. They actually focused minds uh, and, and finance, but they were largely about what I would call the social goods, the health and education. This is not to say health and education don't have economic impacts. Of course they do. But the reason you want to try and uh, advance on those against those goals are very much for social reasons, I think. And those goals were seen very much as public sector-led goals that the public and sector... And financed. Yeah. And financed mm. largely through grant aid. Mm. And so uh, the, the, the nexus was really quite a narrow one in terms of what the goals were and how they should be financed. What's happened now, uh, 20 years odd later, is that we now have an understanding that development is a much more complex set of uh, outcomes that we're looking for. They involve economic uh, goals as well as social goals. So we now have the Sustainable Development Goals agreed by uh, all the members of the United Nations back in 2015. Uh, and the financing of those goals cannot be done in the old way. Yes, you still need domestic resources from the countries concerned. Yes, you will need some grant funding for sure. But there's no way infrastructure, energy, other some of those economic development goals could be financed by those means alone. You now need to bring in private sector financing, private sector delivery of many of those goals. That's a big game changer. By the way, the fact that we have now 17 sustainable development goals also tells you that people are thinking in a much more holistic, wider way about development than perhaps we did when we created the MDGs. So the SDGs have brought us that agenda, on top of which, and this is one of the SDGs, the whole climate change mm. agenda. So the Paris Agreement also at the end of 2015, again, you know, very much pushed uh, the wider climate change goals. They're now embedded in the SDGs as well. So you've got to think about how development finance, finance for development, is going to also help us advance work uh, against climate change. So just to dissect some of those bits, uh, let, let's take one section. I mean, you could almost say, can you, that the, the MDGs were really about bringing the world out of a sort of base level of poverty. And we've gone beyond that. I think that's absolutely right. I think, um, you know, to be fair, though, um, there were periods in the past, uh, if you think of the 1950s, 60s, where people were into mega economic uh, projects, dams and Mm. and so on, and power stations, big projects, um, which were also uh, on, you know, being financed largely through grant aid at that that time. Then we moved into the sort of narrower Mm. MDG set, and now the wider SDG set. 
Uh, I think what's happened is there's an appreciation that development has multifaceted characteristics. It's not a narrow set of characteristics and that you need to advance on a wider set of goals. I think what's the big flip change, though, is the financing, mm. that um, that has changed radically in the, the thinking that, you know, you need to bring in private finance to do this. And moreover, that private finance is interested and thinks it can actually make a profit in actually doing this, but also do some good. And there are some key points, aren't there, in that? And that is that I guess we have to start with the thought there isn't enough public money around. Uh, and maybe there's a question as to whether private finance delivers some things more efficiently. Yeah, I think we're, we have to be hard-headed realists mm. here. I mean, if you look at uh, the Glen Eagle Summit Agreement of 2005, the whole of the G7 uh, signed up to trying to get to the 0.7 target. Well, only one member of the G7 made it, which is the mm. UK, and it's, it's enshrined in law in the UK and will continue to do it. But other, outside of the UK, it's really the Dutch and the Scandinavians who have tended to be focused on that uh, target. And it's it's quite clear that we've come, we're coming out of a period of austerity, but it's quite clear that aid budgets have been hit during that period. And I think there is a sort of uh, grant aid pessimism out there, which is difficult to tackle. I mean, there's, there's, it's not going to be the first priority for any government uh, these days. So um, that's one angle. But secondly, it anyway, grant aid isn't the right instrument for some of the things we're trying to do. Uh, and I think what we've learned is that there's a wider set of um, projects and investment possibilities which actually require commercial, commercially-based financing, which is, again, a big shift in our thinking. What's the problem, do you think, that will come about if we can't manage to harness private sector uh, funding? What, where do we end up without that? Well, I, I'm pretty sure we're 12 years away now from the 2030 deadline for these uh, SDGs that if we have business as usual, if we're just doing what we're doing, all of us are doing at the moment, we're not going to get near hitting these targets by 2030. Uh, the issue that really frightens me is that actually all the decision makers in the shareholder governments of the international institutions will probably not focus on this issue, this whole challenge until very late in the day, because it's not a politically difficult issue right mm. now. It's uh, it's 12 years away, that's at least two and a half election cycles. Uh, and so they'll probably get to it in 2025, 2026, when suddenly it becomes patently obvious that we're off track. That is why institutions like the EBID and others have really got to now make the case early, not, it's not that early, 12 mm. years is, is not that long a time, but we've got to make the case now for why decision makers should focus on how we're going to finance so we give ourselves a real chance of trying to get to the goals by 2030. And that's a, you know, both a political challenge, but it's also an evidence-based, policy-based channel challenge for all of us. And do you think one way of focusing politicians' minds is to, you know, you mentioned climate change and climate mitigation activity, that, you know, that's important as well, green economy within the whole SDG uh, context. Do you think one way of getting them to focus earlier is by uh, highlighting a topic like that. And the reason I, I mentioned that is because, obviously, for most politicians at home, the electorates are not that fixated on how aid is de delivered or uh, economies elsewhere are improved. But an issue like climate change, which affects not only countries which we might be helping, which need help, sure. but actually also sure. have a global impact, might be one way of getting politicians to focus on it. So I think, without a doubt, uh, climate change has become the sort of issue that focuses attention from politicians. The One Planet Summit in Paris uh, in December was seeking very much to do that because, it, it, you know, several leaders have begun to worry about whether the positivity and energy of the Paris agenda of 2015 was being lost uh, in subsequent years. And I think the, the French government and others really were trying very much to push it back on the agenda and I think did a very good job of that, actually. That's one. And that's, a, you know, one, of course, an area where EBID is extremely strong, and I'm sure we'll come on to that. The, uh, another area for those who, you know, people are touched by different, uh, mm. different agendas. For some in Europe, whether it's in Eastern or Western Europe, the migration agenda is another reason for why uh, sustainable development is very important, because generally the belief is that uh, after a period of long term, migration flows would be less if countries were developing faster mm. in the first place. One of the reasons is a push factor. Uh, it isn't just a pull factor of a richer, wealthier Europe that's pulling migrants towards us, but conflict, uh, slow development in many of these countries is also pushing 
people into migration. So, so there are different reasons for different people, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, the heart of it is whatever your reason, you've got to tackle these development goals uh, and you've got to find the right finance to do that. And, of course, the uh, EBRD's activities in the green sector have been growing all the time uh, with our green economy transition work. That's right, Jonathan. I mean, you know, this is an area where EBRD is regarded by multilateral development banks as the leader, particularly in our work with the private sector. We set ourselves a very ambitious target in the green economy space of 40% of our investments by end of 2020 would be in the green uh, area. Uh, and it's ended up with 43%. Uh, already by the end of 2017. So we've hit this target three years early, um, showing great ability, I think, in this area. And so if you take the whole argument about um, business models and skill sets being really important uh, and specialization, if you like, well, this is an area where, you know, EBRD could offer much more to a wider region than we currently do. And I think it should be part of that debate as well. And in a moment, we'll go on to examine what it is the EBRD has been doing to draw in private uh, sector money into this uh, development drive, but also what, what we can do more in future. Just a reminder, you're listening to Pocket Economics, the EBRD podcast on how economic ideas help to change people's lives. I'm Jonathan Charles. Today, we're discussing the future of development finance with Suma Chakrabarty, the EBRD president, who's making his debut on the podcast. Uh, Suma the EBRD's role. So obviously, since the very inception of the EBRD, uh, back then in 1991, the whole idea was, as you've been setting out, really, it was it was an early starter in the field of yeah. bringing in private sector money. Yeah, so the EBRD is still uh, one of only two international bodies, the other being the International Finance Corporation, the World Bank Group, that really is focused uh, very much on the private sector development uh, and using and, and dragging in, crowding in, uh, private sector finance. That's very much what we do. Uh, we also work with the, uh, with the public sector, of course, but the majority of the funding, uh, as you know, goes very much into working with private sector clients. So we have a business model that's tried and tested. We're now, what, some 27 years of it, uh, very successfully done. Um, what's really rather interesting about it is that it's been so successful that what was seen in 1991 by our founders as a bank that would last maybe 10 years at most uh, has now a very rather long long life ahead of it. 5,000 uh, projects so far, 5, uh, projects tens of billions of investment. Yeah. Indeed so. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting, apart from the projects and the billions, that success has led on four occasions for the shareholders to say, we think you should take this magic to some new places too. So there was Mongolia. Now, when Mongolia first became a country of operations, you could see it still being EBRD, in the, the EBRD was still doing its the job it had always done because Mongolia was a former communist country, but then when Turkey became a country of operations, Turkey was never a communist uh, economic model. It was always had a very strong private sector focused growth, and then of course Semed uh, again uh, these were market economies but not yet effective markets I would say, and then Greece and Cyprus uh, the fourth edition uh, after the crisis so. On each occasion, the shareholders, I think, extremely wisely said the EBRD business model, what it does, what it focuses on, is distinct and it can therefore add to what other international uh, bodies are doing, other multilateral development banks are doing. So in each of those cases, the shareholders said, we don't think that the MDBs are perfect substitutes for each other. We think they're different, actually. And I think that's still the case today. I think we bring something quite special, quite different to uh, the party, if you like. In development, and uh, you know, I think one of the greatest tests for me of that is the former African Development Bank president Donald Kabaruka standing up and saying, "We need the EBRD in uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, in our, what we call SEMED, uh, because we, the African Development Bank, don't have that business model. We're good at the public sector projects, but we need an EBRD to come in and help us." And so there was no sort of jealousy or pettiness about this. It was actually a warm embrace of us coming in. Uh, rec- in recognition of the distinct different attributes of these international institutions. Does that tell you something? Does that tell you it's not easy to replicate what the EBRD is doing in the short term or even in the medium term by, by creating other, in effect, EBRD model uh, yeah. style institutions following the EBRD model? Yeah. 
what it tells me is the world needs a mix of models. Uh, you know, wouldn't, we would not succeed against this agenda if every institution was the, like the EBRD, nor would we succeed if everyone was just focused on the public sector mm. traditional projects. You need a mix. And there's so much work to do in trying to achieve these goals. There's no displacement effect. That's also what it te- tells me. You know, I think, uh, I think people worry un- unduly about that sort of thing. And they worry about what I would call geographical neatness. Mm. I mean, our shareholders have clearly not worried about that in the past. And I think uh, they need to continue that bold understanding the business model actually at the end of the day is even more important than geography. Uh, and you can learn about geography, you can learn about con- countries relatively quickly, particularly if you have our model, which has lots of resident offices, which are staffed by many people from those countries. They, they have the local knowledge uh, of what matters, the cultures of the countries. So you can actually um, get over the lack of country knowledge uh, in the immediate term. I think it's very difficult in the medium and longer term for bodies that have really grown up over 50, 60 years in one direction to suddenly say, wake up one morning and say, actually, we're now going to become really private sector focused. Um, I think that's really difficult. So it's a cultural, a culture it's question. It's a cultural thing. And I, I, think, I think it's very interesting that in the case of the Inter-American Development Bank, another sister regional organization, they've gone down a different route than just trying to create a vice presidency within the body. They've actually recognized you need a different mindset, different culture to go for private sector financing and delivery. So they've created a, a, a separate organization uh, altogether, a subsidiary that focuses exclusively on private sector and recruits differently and from different markets to do that. That's that's an understandable good, and I would say a good response. Um, but now with 2030 only 12 years away, I think the idea that all the multilaterals should suddenly grow their own private sector arms and get there in time, I think is for the birds. I think it's yeah. not going to happen. So, you, I mean, you set out very clearly then the case that we've got to bring in more private sector uh, financing in order to deliver the sustainable development goals, indeed the, the whole development uh, mm. agenda. Uh, it won't be done otherwise. So bearing that in mind, what, in your mind, needs to happen next? What, what well, should happen next? I think, first of all, um, there's quite a big debate going on about what should happen next at a global level and at a European level. I think what's interesting for me as president of EBRD is how EBRD has become centre stage in this debate in a way that when the MDB, MDGs were created, we were sort of, uh, you know, at stage right, mm. if you like, and uh, doing really good work, but seen as a bit of a niche player, really. Uh, because the change in the goals becoming more economic and the need for more private sector financing, our business model has pushed us centre stage. Mm. Um, and I think that's really important. It's really good news for the EBRD. But it means that I think in the uh, debate about the, what is the right global architecture to deliver these SDGs, there's a review going on now, a G20-led review by the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore. Uh, one of the questions they're going to have to ask themselves is this question about business model versus geography, you know, or geographical neatness, as I call it. That is already broken down. But still, obviously, there are some shareholders who think that in terms of neat geographical packages. Um, the world doesn't really wait uh, in that way. And anyway, most of these development problems cross borders. Take climate change for one. You know, you can't really tackle it in just one country. Uh, you've got to have a you know cross-border approach. Um, so I think that's one big debate. Then there's also the European development architecture debate mm. that has started. You, you're probably all aware that... Um, the EIB, a sister organization, has put forward an idea for a European Union a Bank for Investment and Partnerships, UBIP, as it might be called. Um, and I think there, um, you know, one of the things I think Werner Hoy has done is done a service, actually, to the development field because he's actually said there is a problem that we need to work out how we're going to solve. Now, I think one of the lessons of the EBRD experience, the successes of EBRD, is you solve development problems by creating effective and sustainable markets. So what do, what do you need to do? So if you create this sort of entity, and I'm, I'm on record, public record on this, you do need to make sure the rules of engagement with other development players are on a level playing field. So you need to have pricing that is uh, market-based. You need to have a ability to work on reforms and conditionalities that really takes countries forward, makes them more open for investments from the private sector, not not less likely to invest. So you really need that, and you need open architecture, as I call it. So where the European Union provides grants and its instruments, its guarantees, they need to be open to a wider set of, of players than just the EU player and the EU bank, if you like. So I think um, at a minimum, uh, that is 
you know, est establishing a rules of engagement for all the development uh, players to be able to actually work together better. Uh, a market-based, you know, focus on development requires market-based practices, essentially, um, by definition. Um, so I think that's really important uh, to take those two pieces of work that are going on right now, the global work led by the G20 and then the EU work led by the Commission particularly, and try and make sure that we use both processes to advance, what I would say, the EBRD model. And just then finally, I mean, bear in mind that's what needs to happen. How long do you think have we got to take decisions? Well, you know, uh, this is beyond my pay grade in a way, but I, I really hope that the shareholders don't need to wait until the problem hits them in the face, which is a few years before the deadline, because it will be too late. Because uh, development isn't, a, isn't something you can just do overnight. You need to really plan for it, and you need to get the financing in place, and you need to have the permission to do things uh, early, 12 years away, we need decisions in the next year, two, two years max, really. By 2020, if we have not sorted this out, we will be off track and unlikely to be able to achieve those goals. For the EBRD, what does that mean? I think, first of all, um, you know, I've always seen it as part of a package. I think the central element has to be trying to do even more in our existing region of operations. We have a very heterogeneous uh, region. It's difficult to call it a region, really. Uh, we're the only regional bank that's not, not, not in one region. But anyway, um, let's call it our regional operations, stretching, stretching from Casablanca to, um, to Vladivostok, you know, and from Tallinn down to Cairo. I mean, what are we going to do in terms of scaling up a little bit more? Can we do a bit more? We've had records broken for the last few years. I'm very proud of the EBRD staff and what they've done. Uh, absolutely fantastic performance, actually. Uh, but I want to squeeze a bit more out of them. I want them to try and uh, challenge some of the assumptions, work with our board to try and challenge some of those assumptions because they're not actually all determined by staff. They're determined quite often by board guidance and see if we can do some more investment and policy work within our existing region. But the second part of the package seems to me a question that is only shareholders can solve and they've solved it four times already in the favour of the business model over geography, which is actually thinking about whether EBRD should take up some of the uh, challenge in selected countries in a gradual way beyond our existing region. And that, uh, I think, particularly sub-Saharan Africa is the obvious uh, region uh, in that respect. We already have many, many uh, of our clients, um, whether they're clients from Morocco or Tunisia or Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, but also some clients from Eastern Europe uh, Greece, for example, Southeastern Europe, asking whether we can accompany them on a journey to countries in some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the question is there. It's on the table. It's, uh, you can't uh, not answer this question. And I think a package approach whereby doing more in our existing re uh, countries but also taking on a few more over time would be a good answer to this. And fortunately, compared with the other multilateral development banks, we have capital. And if we don't use that capital, the question I'd pose to shareholders is, well, you're, you're the ones who have provided this capital. You need to think about the most efficient use of this capital. So is it sensible to keep this capital idle or to use it, actually, for the goals that you have signed up to internationally? That seems very clear. Suma, thank you for those very clear messages. I uh, hope to get you back on the podcast to discuss other issues at, at some stage. Um, by the way, if you're interested in learning more about this topic, you'll find lots of examples on ebrd.com of the sort of private sector investment that the EBRD brings into its countries, sort of projects that we invest in, uh, and that's very relevant to this particular topic that we've been discussing today. So take a look on ebrd.com. Uh, watch this space. We'll also hope to be uh, hearing soon uh, other views on the future of development finance from experts outside the multilateral development bank world so we'll bring you that in the weeks and months ahead uh, share your thoughts with us of course at ebrd on twitter and facebook visit itunes soundcloud and ebrd.com slash podcast and there you can download uh, previous episodes until next time though goodbye <laughs>